All right, everybody. My name is Russell McFarland, and we are going to be doing Security 101 tonight. There's been a lot of interest around, uh, you know, cameras and security systems, and a lot of questions. And I think lighting folks naturally migrate that way. Uh, it's a it's a neat thing to to go out there and kind of explore technology in different ways with your home, whether that's lighting or or video or alarms and things like that. So you know, when we talk about security. And Christmas, I think they do go together. Uh, unfortunately, you do see vandalism from time to time on displays. I know that we've seen that in the past. Um, fortunately, I don't think it's very common, but you know, it kind of ties us back in to, to talk about some things you can do to protect your home, to protect your display, not just at Christmas, but year round. And so we're gonna go through that. We're gonna do a couple things. We're gonna go through uh, general security rules and, and techniques and ideas as well as you know, kind of wrap up on video, which I know there's been a lot of interest and we spent a lot of late nights on Zoom talking about those things. So we'll kind of address some of those things and then we'll stop the recording uh, and I'm glad to take questions and we're gonna do uh, kind of a security design review on someone's home. I went on the Facebook group and, and solicited uh, a volunteer to um, have their home reviewed. And so we'll kind of look at pictures and, and concepts and, and go and kind of do a security design review for that home afterwards so that'll be uh, kind of a neat time to apply some of these concepts so getting started uh the topics for tonight we'll go through some basic truths some basic ground rules of what we'll be talking about and some just some good mindsets to go into as you're looking at security design uh, we're, we are going to do that physical security assessment and we'll talk about some of those techniques uh, talk about home lighting and when i say that i don't mean christmas lighting i mean actual uh, security lighting ambient lighting around your home We'll talk about some display tips, how to keep your display safe during the season, and as well as you know, talk about cameras. So anytime we talk about security, you want to think like the bad guys. You want to look at your house like a criminal would. And I do a lot of critical infrastructure stuff and, and different things. So we're looking at all of this through a lens of home security. We're not going to be talking about insider threats and you know terrorists and, and outside actors and all that. We're just going to be talking about you know, thinking like your standard home thief, uh, your standard criminal, your standard vandal, what they're looking for is soft targets. You know, criminals don't want to be caught, they're lazy, and they're looking for an opportunity. So we don't want to go and be that guy, and we don't want to be vulnerable. Uh, we don't want to make life easy for them. We want to make things tough, and we're going to be talking about that. Uh, there's no one size fits all. So, I mean, I see that question all the time. What camera should I buy or what alarm system should I buy? You know, it really depends. It really depends on your situation. It really depends on a lot of your environmentals. It depends on what you're trying to protect, what's important to you. And it also depends on, you know, budget and things like that. So what we always want to be doing is a cycle of assessing, always looking at your situation, seeing where are my pain points, where am I vulnerable? And then we want to prioritize those things and say, what can I do right now? What's the best thing for my buck? Where am I going to be hurt the most? And we can go and prioritize those things and then, uh, you know, go and remediate those things in those situations, review that. And we always want to be reviewing security. We want to make sure that our stuff's online, that our stuff's working. We want to make sure that we haven't introduced something new. There's not a new variable. And we always want to be reviewing our security and then we repeat. We go in based off of our review and based off of our findings, based off of our prioritizations, we're going to go and reassess and reprioritize and remediate, being that cycle of doing those things. So when we look at a security situation, when we look at your home, we're going to say, hey, what are your areas of concern? You know, do you have a, a shed in the back with a lot of valuable stuff in it? Are you worried about somebody coming through uh you know, an opening in a fence. Are you worried about those things? Let's look at our lighting. Lighting, once again, we're trying to ward off crimes of opportunity. If you have a very well-lit yard, a very well-lit house, uh, it's not nearly as attractive as somebody that can go, to, you know, three doors down to a pitch black dark house and, you know, crawl around back. That's a lot more inviting. So how is your lighting? That's cheap. That's easy. That's something we can solve. So let's look at those things. What's in plain view? Once again, let's eliminate those crimes of opportunity. Let's not have a bunch of attractive things out in the yard or out in your house or out in a window that, you know, computers and a big, you know, screen TV hanging through your front window is probably not a great idea. It's attractive. Um, how are they physically secured? So do you have locks? Do you have fences? Do you have gates? Um, let's talk about those things. When I say 
let's look at your choke points. That's important. And that means where do I funnel? You know, where does this traffic funnel in? That, you know, like your driveway most likely is a choke point where most people come through. Uh, it could be a path that, you know, if you live on a one-way street, that would be a choke point. You know, there's one way in, one way out. It could be your entryways, your doors. You know, somebody's going to have to come through a door or a window. So where are your choke points? Where can you concentrate your efforts to kind of assess and look at things and, and focus your efforts there? Um, so how do we deter things and how do we detect things? So how do we keep the bad guys away? And once again, that's with lighting, locks, things like that. And then how do we detect it once they come in? You know, how do we detect things, whether that be video and video analytics, whether that be alarms, but we want to know what something's happening so we can act on that. Security is all about layers. And I'm, I'm a cybersecurity guy uh, by trade and by heart. And um, I've had the opportunity to work in physical security most of my career um, in that cyber realm. But security is all about layers. Um, we don't want to have just one line of defense. If you're counting on a camera to keep you safe, it's not going to happen. Cameras don't keep you safe. If you're, you know, relying on lights to keep you safe, you know, that's a good step, but uh, it's not, you know, it's not all uh, encompassing. So we need to have layers of security in all that we do. And then just that constant prioritization of going out there and seeing your biggest weaknesses and, and, and addressing those as you have budget, time, resources. So we'll start with the easy stuff, uh, lighting locks and more. So I use a combination of area lighting and motion lighting. Uh, I think that it's important to have a well-lit house all the way around. Uh, you don't want your entranceways and your windows to be in the dark. Uh, I use, you know, dust to dawn lighting. And then I also have interest of uh, motion lighting. So that you know, is the element of surprise, really, when you walk around and you're you know, already in a kind of a well-lit area, but you're going to get popped with motion as well. And that tends to deter stuff. I've got friends that have video um, of people that they've called on their surveillance cameras of hitting those motion lights and running off. And it's something I've seen too in my career uh, where somebody hits a motion light and runs off because it feels, once again, you think like a criminal, you're a bad actor. Once you hit that motion light and you see light come on, it's startling and you usually run away unless you're extremely motivated. Uh, keep things out of plain view. That's an easy, free thing to do. And we talked about that earlier. I uh, don't have a bunch of stuff laying out, lawnmowers, uh, outside, you know, yard equipment, open sheds, open buildings. Keep your cars locked. Uh, you'll see a lot of people go in there and jiggle door handles. If you have your car out in the in the driveway, and those are all crimes of opportunity. If you keep stuff out of plain view and keep stuff locked up, um, you're in good shape. And then just move move attractants out. Don't don't draw in problems. And that could be bushes and things like that too. Don't keep your bushes up high. Don't give places for people to hide. Uh, don't make it easy on them. So you need to move uh, attractive nuisances. Alarms as well. Alarms aren't going to cure all your problems, you know, because once somebody hits an alarm. They're most likely, you know, at your door and they've been in, but that's another layer. And that's a good thing because that allows you to have that additional check to say, I know if they get past the locks and get, you know, and they're bold enough to get past the lighting, then the alarms are going to go off. And that's that third layer. So that's, that's an important step. So display protection, bring it back to Christmas. Um, I say, turn the lights on. When my show goes off at night at you know, 10 PM, I turn, I've got area lights coming on. And a lot of us talk about, hey, how can we go kill off that street light? How can we go do this and that? You know what? I've got a street light out front on purpose, and I leave that on during the show. And then when it goes off, uh, when the show goes off, I turn on every exterior light I have because I don't want a car full of teenagers rolling in at 2 a.m. and going and kicking down everything. That's not necessarily going to stop them, but it becomes a lot less attractive than your you know, displaced in the pitch black dark. I also, if you look at the picture on the right, that's a $40 uh, light from Costco. It's a motion floodlight, LED floodlight. It's already weather sealed. I went and put it in, a, you know, heat shrinked it up, put a, in an AC plug on it, and then I'll go and put that on a timer so when the show goes off, that comes on, and then I'll wire tie it to a gutter, wire tie it to a column, and once again, that's that extra layer. When you come in, I've got area lights around the house, and then I've got that stuff pointed dead at the display, so I don't want it triggering during the show and being, you know, being a giant distraction. But uh, since it's timed and it comes on at, you know, after the show goes off, if you walk in the yard, it's going to go and start, you know, stroking on everything, and that's a deterrent. And that's cheap. It's forty bucks. It's easy to do. It's temporary, and you can put it anywhere. Um, Cameras can be uh, you know, very helpful. I go out there and use cameras for a few different things in my display. Obviously, I've got the, you know, the general security cameras. I also use utility cameras for, um, for traffic. 
so I can go out there and keep an eye on how the traffic's doing, and I'll actually go in there and, and shorten the show if traffic is bad. I can keep a, a watchful eye, and that's something I implemented my second year as we had traffic problems, and I became a lot more cognizant of that stuff and worked with my neighbors more, and I would actually control the flow based off of you know, cameras I had set up and, and monitoring that, so that's good. Other things you can do, um, some people tether down their stuff. I'm not real big into that, but you know, if you wanted to go and put a ground acre in and tether down your yard props, that's fine. Uh, my friend Ricky, down bottom, y'all probably seen this on the Facebook group, kind of clever, p painted his uh, stuff red and put high voltage on it. And so, uh, you know, once again, that's not a, not a bad idea. And I thought that was kind of clever. Um, you know, once again, if they get to that point, I don't think anybody's going to be messing with it and starting to open up boxes, but uh, I think it is uh, a natural deterrent. It's easy to do, so that's kind of that's kind of cool. So cameras. So why do we have them? I just got done saying that they're not for active protection because they're not going to protect you from anything. Uh, they can deter us so if people look for cameras and if they see, you know, dogs hanging up places or cameras hanging out of the sockets, you know, it, it becomes less attractive. So they can deter. And if people know you have cameras, I had a friend like that recently, just yesterday that said, yeah, I don't want to go over to their house because they got a ring doorbell. I'm like, well, that's, ring doorbells are a whole different thing, but we can talk about later. But uh, anyway, they didn't even want to go over there because they had a ring doorbell. And they might pop up on cameras. There. So um, it does allow you to assess an active situation. So you can go out there based off of your other uh, layers. You can go out there and assess and say, man, I just had an alarm trigger. I just had a motion light go off. Let me back up 10 seconds and let's see what happened that caused that motion light to go off. Was it a cat or was it somebody you know, running off into the woods? Uh, we can go back and look at that. We can look back forensically and see what happens. Uh, it adds a layer of security, which is important. It is an additional layer. And it can alert. You've got a lot more intelligence built into NBRs and to software now where, hey, I've detected motion. I'm going to send you a push alert to your phone. And you can go out there and, and have real-time analytics and be able to assess what's going on and be actively alerted. As well as when I say analytics, I'm talking about video analytics to where it can do car counting, people counting. It can do tripwire detection where, say, if you come over this line that I've driven, that I've drawn in software, it's going to go and send an alert out, and it's going to go and trigger. And so that's video analytics, and that's that's a, a real popular trend going on now. Technology's got to the place where analytics are pretty dang good, and it's becoming a lot more commonplace, and the cost of all that's coming down. So cameras, that the whole security market is as fragmented as any other industry out there. I mean, it is wildly fragmented, and so I think that's why people get so confused when they talk about, okay, what kind of camera should I buy? I'll sell some stuff to Costco for $3.99. It comes with a whole bunch of cameras and this cool little box. What do I do? Um, as well as you can go from there and you can buy cameras that I've seen uh, in production for $90,000 a piece. So, you know, there's a huge range of variables and it's full of acronyms and focal lengths and frames per second and on this. And what does all this mean? So, you know, we're going to try to talk about some of those things and, and kind of stew it down a little bit. Uh, you have IP cameras, which are internet protocol cameras, and you have analog cameras, which are kind of the old school BNC closed circuit TV cameras, and uh, those are two different technologies. You have fixed lens cameras that don't zoom. Uh, you have varifocal lens cameras that do zoom, but it's more for a setup thing. Uh, you have PTZ, which is pan tilt zoom. Uh, which can kind of swivel all around, and that's what you see at like a casino or whatever. Uh, as well as fisheye cameras, which are 360, 360 degree cameras that you can do different views with, and it goes on and on and on. There's tons of you know, variety out there, and it all depends on your situation. As well as sensors, sensor sizes, so how many megapixels is that camera, and what kind of sensor does it have, and how sensitive is that sensor to light. Uh, you've got turrets versus domes, and the, the point is, is there's so many variables out there that you can't just cookie cutter it and say, we're going to have a SQL camera that we're going to recommend, or we're going to have this one thing that we're going to do that applies in all situations. That's not the case. It's critical to have the right camera for the job. So what you need to do is start with that design review, start with that audit and identify uh, where you can put those cameras and where you need them the most and you know where they're suited. So go out there and ask, hey, what concerns you? Go back to those choke points and say, where can I go and capture people coming in and coming out best? You know, if you've got a big fence line, wood line, 
something like that. It may not be as a concern as an open driveway down a one-way street or a gate. Um, your environmentals play a big concern as far as, you know, is this inside, is this outside? Can I get a wire there? Uh, can I go out there and, and, you know, is there going to be a lot of glare coming off of this soffit? Uh, am I going to be able to use infrared, whatever? And, of course, budget always comes into play. So I'm going to try to break down some terminology that we see and that make a big difference based off, you know, based off of your situation and what kind of camera you're going to get. Um, so the first thing you'll see is focal length. All the lenses you'll see in millimeters. Uh, real common is the 2.8 millimeter lenses, a 3.2 millimeter lens, and a 4 and a 6. And those are all focal lengths. So that's basically the, the, the distance from the lens to the sensor. And the lower the number, the wider the image gets. And I stuck a little chart down there that shows you know your your angle of view um, based off of the focal length of your lens and so that all comes with a with kind of a cost so you say well i want to get you know wide views of everything that's fine is but we'll show you later that when it comes to identification that kind of stinks uh, you can get a big wide shot and that's what i do with traffic cameras obviously i go out there i want to see the whole street and see how busy it is I'll have a really wide shot, but if I wanted to identify somebody standing, you know, 20, 30, 40 feet away off that really wide shot, I'm not going to get a lot of detail because I'm gathering that giant wide scene. <clears throat> um, the lower your number is, the wider uh, the shot, so 2.8 is really wide, uh, 50 is not so wide. And um, the fixed versus varifocal, I recommend varifocal cameras, which means it has a range of focal lengths that you can actually zoom through. And so I put in a lot of 2.8 to 12 millimeter, which is a really popular range. And so that way you don't have to be dead on when you're selecting cameras. They cost a little bit more, but you can go out there and adjust that camera based off of your very specific situation and tune it in you know, specifically for uh, that camera spot. And you can fine tune that focal length down and really get some, some good quality there. Um, ideally, the field of view is the same as your area of interest. So you don't want to gather. What I mean is, is set to where you are specifically watching and you're not gathering a lot of unnecessary detail. So that can be seen in this shot. Uh, this is a sample picture of the range of focal lengths at the same exact location looking at the same exact subject but at different focal lengths. So the top left is 2.8 millimeter so it's a super wide shot. If you look at the dumpster it's off in the distance and you know you can kind of see what's going on you know, from the warehouse doors all the way to the edge of the parking lot but you're not going to get a lot of extreme detail based off of who's going to that dumpster. You would know an individual went to that dumpster, but it would be kind of tough to ID them. If you look, oh man, I've mislabeled this. So on the right, it's actually five millimeters. And so that is, you know, closer, but you're still getting the surrounds of, you know, the environment around it. Uh, bottom left is 12 millimeter, and then you go to 50 millimeters. So you get a lot more detail. And so when I say, you want to pick the focal length for your field of view. If I said, I want to watch who's coming into that dumpster, um, I'm going to say, well, that's going to be probably 12 to 20 uh, millimeters, and that would be a pretty you know, a pretty good focal length. You know, 50 is pretty tight, but you can get that detail, um, and that's where you want to go, go in there and have the right camera for the job because if you're you know, buying a 2.8 millimeter camera and you're trying to watch that dumpster, you're not going to get a whole lot of ID out of it. Camera resolution, so that's megapixels basically. It's how much detail is that sensor and that camera grabbing? How fine is that image? It's always looking at the same you know, picture, but how much detail are you grabbing out of it? And the important thing to, to you know, mention, and you get in this, I'm a photographer as well, and people get to the megapixel wars and they think, well, man, if I buy this four megapixel camera, it's going to be a whole lot better than this two megapixel camera. That's not necessarily the case. Um, the pixels determine uh, potential, not quality. And so basically that's saying that, you know, you're going to get an equally as quality of an image out of a two megapixels or four megapixel camera that zoomed all the way out. But that detail is not going to be there. So as you zoom in, uh, you'll have more detail in the four millimeter camera because you're gathering that much more detail. But um, yeah, that comes with a cost. Oftentimes, and it, it, it doesn't scale like that. So down bottom, I said lenses, compression, image processing, all of that stuff makes a big difference. So if you buy a very low quality eight, mil, eight megapixel camera and compare that to a very high quality, very expensive two megapixel camera, uh, it's not gonna, you know, it, it's not gonna even be close. That two megapixel camera of higher quality is gonna get a lot better because it's got 
better lenses, it's got better compression, it's got better processing, and it's going to be a lot better. So it just depends. You can't just equate megapixel to, to image quality. Um, oftentimes, and not always, but oftentimes, uh, the higher uh, the megapixel rating, the poor performance at night. And um, that's a, kind of a universal thing. And like I said, there's exceptions to that. And technology is improving that, but, um, but that still is the case. So this kind of shows um, that example. You have the same picture um, of all this, of all these scenes, but uh, you can see the sliding scale from, you know, standard 640 by 480 image VGA quality all the way up to 6 megapixel. And so you're capturing that much more detail, uh, and you can see it step by step by step. So then you can digitally zoom in, and ideally you're going to be able to capture a lot more stuff digitally because you've got that detail captured from the sensor. So frame rate, if you ever see security video of people like jagged jumping around and, and stuttering around, that's all frame rate. So how many uh, frames are you capturing per second? How many still images are you kind of, if you ever did that flip book as a kid where you did the cartoon um, and you flip it back and forth and see the motion, uh, you're getting a bunch of still images and putting them together um, to make a movie. And so this is the same kind of deal. Your frames per second is how many still images you're kind of collecting to, um, to equate to a movie. And so, you know, you can, most cameras will go anywhere from one to 30 uh, frames per second. You can get, you know, really high uh, frame rate cameras for really specific, like money counting or something like that. <clears throat> but once again, by default, you may say, well, I want to, you know, do 30 frames per second for everything. But what you're doing is if you go look at examples on YouTube, um, you can see it and people put it side by side. Uh, you're, you're really not capturing uh, that much better quality from a security standpoint by doing 30 frames a second. And you're taking up a whole lot more bandwidth and a whole lot more space and a whole lot more you know, processing power it takes to, to analyze that stuff at 30 frames per second. Um, industry averages around 7 to 10. Uh, 10 looks pretty dang good. And that's one of those kind of good numbers to shoot for uh, when you talk about frame rate and security, where it's a good smooth image and you can capture a good, good amount of detail, but it's not going to go and just hammer your system like a 30 frame per second camera would. So, you know, that, that makes a big difference in how you can manage that stuff long term. So camera height, and you see a lot of this stuff when you go out there and um, see cameras way at the top of buildings, or I've had friends say that, like, hey, man, I got this good spot on the second story. It's like the bird's eye view. You can see everything. And that's okay, once again, if you're doing traffic or you're doing a general overview. But when you, you know, try to do recognition, it stinks. Um, you really want that about head high if you're doing a, you know, a facial recognition camera. Uh, that'll go out there and get you a good idea on something. And I thought this was a good graphic that showed we're going to take the same camera in the same location, put it at 17 feet, drop it to 13 feet, drop it to 8 feet, and drop it to 5, and you can see the facial recognition on that. And like I said, I blew up the image where it's, it's hard to see, but you get the point. If you walk into any Walmart, they've been redoing a lot of their cameras lately, and I guarantee they'll have a Bosch camera that's mounted about head high right by the door. And that's to capture people coming in and out. And if you see surveillance video from them, it's beautiful. Uh, it looks good, and it's right there head high. And so it looks kind of awkward. The next time you walk to Walmart, pay attention when you walk through the doors, and I bet you'll see some head high, and that's to get that facial recognition. Longer distances, you know, if, if you're trying to shoot across a parking lot, the mounting angle doesn't matter quite as much um, because you're not going to, you know, this is all for close range uh, people viewing cameras. So if you're at the top of the building like Walmart, and you see stuff at the top of there. They're looking at the parking lot and general overview stuff. Um, they're not trying to look at people's faces from there. Um, so this shows you kind of um, the maximum height per the subject distance. So if somebody's one feet away, one foot away, like at your door, that's why the ring doorbells and all that are the doorbell cameras are getting more popular. Uh, you can go out there and it's what four feet high, and that's an ideal height. Um, so if you're a foot away from your door, you don't want it any higher than six feet. If you're three feet out, seven feet, and so on. Um, so you can kind of see how that scales. So camera connectivity. Uh, when should you, you use wireless cameras? The answer is never. <laughs> and there'll be controversy about that, and we can talk about that later. But I don't like wireless cameras. There's no such thing as wireless power, and so you're going to have to run power to the cameras anyway. 
unless you're using some of the Arlo's or the little battery cameras, which aren't worth much So um, in most situations. So I greatly prefer PoE cameras, that's power over ethernet. And so that sends data and power over one wire and you can get that to the camera. It's reliable. You don't have any trouble with bandwidth. You don't have any trouble with connectivity. And um, it's just a, a good way to do things as well as, and I don't like the, and we can talk about this more. We'll, I'm trying not to get into a whole bunch of brands and specific recommendations, especially on the formal presentation. We can talk about it later after the presentation's over. But, um, you know, when it comes to the box, SAMs and Costco systems, those are usually analog and you're kind of, you know, sometimes you're trapped in that ecosystem. Whereas if you have an IP camera that's powered over PoE and the camera goes bad or new technology comes out and better cameras come out, which they will, uh, you can go in there and replace those. No problem. Just swap out the, the camera, same network, you know, cord, same everything. And it's just a, a simple swap. And that's, that's pretty helpful later on. As well as when you're connecting things, I say VLAN, all things IoT. And so what that means is create a separate network, just like Ken McMaster talked about a, you know, a few weeks ago in his networking talk. Um, I prefer to run all the stuff in a virtual network um, that is separate from my IT network from a cybersecurity standpoint. Uh, we've talked about that somewhere. These are you know, any, any kind of IoT device, which is Internet of Things. So that could be a garage door opener. That could, and we've got a crop pot that is connected to the internet here, no kidding. And, uh, you know, I don't trust that the Crock-Pot manufacturer is going to update their firmware and there's no telling what kind of holes is involved with that. So I'm not going to put that on my data network. I create a separate network for all those devices and kind of just face them towards the internet and not towards anything else. And um, and I don't even face it towards the internet unless it needs it. But um, they kind of sit there together and um, that way I don't have to worry about girding up my network for the most part. <clears throat> There's two ways to kind of record uh, cameras when it comes to IP cameras. There's NVRs and there's recording it back to a server or a PC. Uh, the NVRs tend to be usually a little bit cheaper, um, but they're typically more difficult to use and um, you know, kind of hokey. And they aren't quite as flexible as some of the software solutions out there. Uh, both are okay. It just depends on your needs, your use case and your budget. And uh, we can talk about that more later, the specifics and use cases. Uh, but like I said, overall, I prefer, personally, I prefer the software solutions a little bit more over the NBRs. So storage, uh, you need to come up with a recording strategy. If you go out there and put 12, 4 megapixel cameras all over your house and record them at 30 frames a second, 24-7, it's going to be a lot of this space that you're going to consume. And, and that's okay. I mean, you're going to go, it's not okay to do that many uh I might be pixel cameras at 30 frames a second, but you know, this space has got cheap and uh, you, know, you need to be able to scale that, but there are calculators that you can go out there and tell you, here's my frame rate, here's my codec, here's what I'm recording, how many days can I get off of it at a 24-7 you know, recording cycle. Um, and then you need to look at retention. Some people's like, I want to keep three years of video or one year of video. Typically, if you're not going to be aware of an incident you know, within 30 days or so, you're probably not going to go back and scrub through all that video. And so you can go in there and mark it, but really a 30 day retention, 60, 90 day retention is usually about all you need. Um, and you can always go, if you do have an incident, go and save it uh, and, and spool it offline. But you really don't need to keep years and years of video online unless you just want to. Uh, edge space recording is becoming a second factor now. So you can go in there and put a micro SD card in a lot of modern cameras. And it'll actually record and buffer to that camera, to that SD card as well. And that way, if you have a failure of your NVR, if your network server, whatever, it'll still record at the edge and you haven't lost anything. So that's kind of a slick second layer of, of backup. And in a home setting, that gets to be pretty extreme, I guess. But in a business setting where they count on this stuff, uh, it's pretty popular. Um, when it comes to motion-based recording, I personally prefer recording 24-7. Uh, once again, analytics are pretty good, but inevitably when you go out there and need and something happens and you need to go back and refer to it, you don't want to, and I've seen it before, you don't want to see that you know the end of the situation happen or you, know, you missed it all together because the cameras didn't pick up on motion because maybe it was too dark or right there at the edge of the frame or something else. And so I, I would rather record 24-7 and mark on motion and just account for my disk space accordingly. 
And that way I know I'm going to have it when I need it. I want it to be there. You know, I put the stuff in there to count on and to be reliable and to be robust. And I record my stuff 24 seven. That's a preference thing, but that's you know, my, my strategy. So the, talking about resources a little bit, IP cam talk is a pretty rich forum. Uh, they've got a lot of guys out there where it's pretty active. I'm not real active out there. I'm not active at all out there. But when it comes to home stuff, uh, they're pretty slick, and they've got some decent recommendations. This is the standard uh, forum kind of environment where they might eat the newbies alive, and, and people that ask silly questions uh, might be a little hostile. But anyway, they've got some good stuff out there, some good reviews, and you can go out there and refer to that. Uh, IPVM.com, I'll show you a tool from them a little bit later. That's a subscription-based forum. Um, more geared for integrators and professionals, but they do have free articles and free tools out there. And I put YouTube down because when you go and start talking about camera specifics, um, it's good to look on YouTube because you'll go out there and see people, you know, if you Google or if you YouTube a uh, camera model number, somebody's probably going to have, you know, examples out there from that. And once again, they've got different lighting, they've got different everything else, and you may not be able to say that's going to look just like my house but you can get a pretty good idea of quality and how stuff holds up. And you know, you'd be surprised how many camera models are out there and people just put clips on, online from their cameras and you can go and gauge quality and expectations based off of those clips. So anyway, I wanted to keep this short and sweet because I know we're kind of deviating from the X likes norm. So I wanted to give some you know, good information and kind of a jumping off point. And I'm happy to talk about specifics. And like I said, once, once this is over, we'll actually go through an exercise and, and look through um, a real life house and, and, and what we'd recommend there. Um, but I'm happy to stick around and we can break out and answer as many questions as you want. And that is it for the formal talk. So if there are any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, I'm looking at chat right now. Um, see if there are anyone, someone says, get a big dog. Um, and then there's a lot of discussion on wireless cameras. I don't know. Do you want to touch on why you say not to use wireless Russell? Yeah. I mean, so once again, I, you know, I, I come from a background where I can't have things fail. Um, in my world, you know, that's not an, that's not an excuse. I can't have stuff fail. And with wireless connectivity, it's gotten a lot better but it's still flaky. Uh, the cameras tend to not be that great. Um, and once again, I'm generalizing stuff. And there's people that are going to beat me up, and I'm sure there's people out there that have 10 Wi-Fi cameras and they work great, but they tend to be lower quality, um, no serious security solution. Very rarely do you have a serious security uh, solution that's wireless. And um, so anyway, I go from a, from a reliability standpoint, from a throughput standpoint, because once you start scaling this stuff out, um, and you have multiple cameras online and you're trying to do that wireless 24 7 at a high you know at a decent frame rate at a decent uh resolution you're going to be clogging up some um some bandwidth and so it just doesn't scale well and i want to count on it i want it to work and still once again like i said <clears throat> if i hang up a wireless camera i'm still gonna have to power it so the way i do because i want it to record all the time and so i'm gonna have to run a wire there anyway and i'd rather that be poe and be robust and be reliable so that's my personal view. So um, the question I have for you is, let's say you have your display actually running and your show's running and your cameras are on. Are there any different settings that you should consider um, with the cameras or anything you should do different, um, you know, when, when you have them running and it's Christmas time and so forth to protect your display? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So um, once again, the Weasley answer is it all depends. But yeah, so if you have um, if you have any kind of cameras are all dependent on light because that's what we're grabbing. We're grabbing light for everything. You know, that's that's what our eyes see. That's what um, you know, how the sensor works is just going out there and grabbing light. And so obviously when you have a lot of high contrast situations, a lot of changing light, it can drive cameras nuts. And um, so you do have to go in there and tweak uh, settings. And that's one of those things where it depends on how it's mounted, where it's mounted, and you know how robust the cameras is. A lot of the modern cameras I'm seeing that are you know, higher quality, uh, they handle that, that changing light pretty well and, and do pretty well with it. 
Um, but you do have to adjust, and especially when you have stuff hanging from the soffits and things like that, where you have it in real close proximity and you have a lot of reflections going on, that drives it nuts. And that's another big win for POE cameras, because I do, I string up temporary cameras uh, based off of how my display is laid out, based off of my areas of interest. And um, I, you know, I've got a network in the yard anyway, and so I can go out there and run a, a line out and put temporary cameras up that aren't you know dead up against props and that aren't dead up against lights that are reflecting and i can move that stuff around and i do that and so it could be that you just place a camera somewhere else uh based off of your display and 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 that works so i have a question russell when it comes to storage when i set up my system i did everything essentially ssd drives do you feel that it's required to use SSD drives or regular hard drives on your NAS system is, it, is uh, uh, efficient enough to be able to handle the recording based on your frame rates? Yeah, so, so, yeah, so, so they are. Um, I, run, I run my applications and database off of an SSD, and then my bulk clips are stored to, to physical disk. And NAS storage works well. Um, I've got a good Christmas light friends that we did a, a big, big setup for. And he's recording to about 50 terabytes worth of NAS storage, and so um, and that's that's a little different situation than a home environment, but still, uh, we put it on a Synology NAS. It works well. I've done that a lot of other places as well, and um, and so we just offload the clips. So what I do is you set retention periods. So all the new stuff and all the clips and all the you know, new writes will go to the SSD, but as the host cell clips age, uh, they'll shuffle off to a NAS or shuffle off to a fixed disk or a set of fixed disks that are rated and um and that's how i do it so i don't write live to the nas but i shuffle it off based off of once i hit 300 gig or whatever or you know x amount of days it will shuffle off to nas storage <laughs> so with the initial recording you do do to ssd yeah i do um and i've got you know enough buffer where i but it doesn't stay there long so and that's not a general rule. It doesn't have to be that way. Uh, that's just because I've got that at my disposal. But yeah, I would not try to store all of my clips on an SSD. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, right. And there's there's drives out there now that are designed. They've got uh, kind of codecs built in, and you know, the Western Digital Purple drives are designed for surveillance. Um, uh, Seagate has one. Uh, I think the Iron Wolves are their NAS drives. But anyway, I think Seagate's got one. There's a few hard drive manufacturers out there that you know optimize their drives for surveillance. And uh, I use a lot of purple drives. Yeah, because storage goes gets filled up pretty quickly. It does. Hey Russell, when it, when it comes to storage, do you do anything with motion record instead of just twenty four seven continuous? I I don't I don't trust it. Um, what I do is I mark on motion that makes you know basically it writes alerts out. Um, to uh, based off of motion in the frame, but so that'll you know help with my processing of it. When I go back and look and say what happened last night, I can go and see those marked alerts. But you know everything before and after is recorded as well because, like I said, I just don't trust analytics, and that's based off of my background um, where I can't afford to lose stuff. So, well, what I usually do is I usually record at a lower rate, continuous. And then when it sees motion, like I'll put a five second post and um, pre and post yeah. point of motion and bump it up to 15. Like I might be recording at seven and yep. up to like 15. Yep. And, and I do that at other places. Silly. Yeah, that's a good strategy. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. We do that in the enterprise. Hey, hey Russell, maybe uh, I wanted to um, actually comment on the whole analog versus IP thing. Yep. Um, just because I've had this discussion lately with a couple of clients of mine. The, the problem with the analog, just so most people know is, I mean, yeah, they're great cameras and they work and they're good for security and stuff like that. But the problem is you're usually brand specific. So if you get a certain brand and that DVR goes down, you have to get that certain brand back versus IP, you don't, right? Yep, that's exactly right. And you'll see a lot of stuff aging and, and people are scrambling for cameras. And uh, you end up on eBay trying to buy pieces and parts of cameras from you know an old SAM system. And I had somebody like that recently that was trying to spend a fortune on you know some old Samsung cameras they bought at Sam's just because they didn't want to you know rewire the place and everything else. And I'm like, well, I was, what are you doing? And the quality was terrible, <laughs> you know. But they were running off old like 
VGA cords or uh, old uh, like SVDA cords and stuff like that. So it's really old antiquated stuff, and and you know retrofitting that stuff later is a pain. So, Russell, do your cameras simply focus on your yard and your house, or do you look at the street and sidewalks and, and surroundings and so forth, and is that something folks should be considering? Yeah. Um, once again, I, you know, it depends on your house. Yeah, I, I look at a lot of different things. Uh, I look at my choke points. I look at overviews. I look at entryways. Um, I look at a lot of different things. And so I have it, just like we talked about in the presentation, where I've got it aimed in directly at what I am interested in. And I know, you know, I know kind of the ebb and flow of things and how things come and go. And, um, and so, yeah, I've got that focused in on, on specific areas uh, that, like I said, that apply. So, and I recommend that everybody do that. Don't just go out there and get a, a bunch of wide angle cameras, which is usually what comes in the box at Sam's. Uh, don't do that. Uh, really focus in on the areas you care about. And, and I'll demo that later. <clears throat> Last question, is there any rule of thumb on the cost of, of a system or a decent system? So if your front yard's a thousand square feet or two thousand, you know, is there any any equation, you know, to uh, to consider? Uh, it, it, no, I, I don't have as good a budget numbers there because it's like anything else. You get it, you get addicted to cameras and addicted to this stuff. Uh, it's horrifically expensive uh, <laughs> over time. So, you know, a, you can get a very good camera for $150, $160 um, a piece, and that's a POE camera. Just like the Pixel World, you've got a lot of associated costs with that. You've got a POE switch, which you can get a good switch for less than 100 bucks. You've got, you know, Cat5 cabling. You've got a PC, which you can get a, a pretty decent PC for, you know, $500 and um, run it. So, you know, you can kind of figure off those numbers. You could probably do a four camera system for a thousand bucks. Don't be, and once again, when you compare that to Sam's, you can get a four, five camera system for three ninety nine. And so, but you can get some, some high quality gear for, you know, four or five camera setup for probably a thousand bucks if you didn't have a PC already and things like that. So that's a, that's kind of a way to scale it, but no, I don't have a good perk. I usually tell people if you're going to do a, a good handful of cameras, 200 bucks a camera is a, a good budget number. Um, and that might be a little cheap anymore. Um, it may need to be 250 per camera, but something like that. Now there are a few quick questions in chat. So uh, maybe we'll take two or three of them and then let you do your um, second part uh, of this. Yeah. Uh, software, is there anything that you would recommend for use with NVR? Yeah, so once again, we're talking about home. Uh, you know, we're not talking about the enterprise or anything like that, but a good, I tell you what, pound for pound, it's hard to beat Blue Iris. Blue Iris is a great piece of software. It's written by just an individual, um, and it's $60, and it runs up to 64 cameras. And uh, I know a lot of us here use that, and uh, that's, that's good software. Um, it's process it's processor intensive, so you need to have a pretty decent machine to run it on. Uh, Intel QuickSync uh, it, it kind of leverages that for decoding, so I recommend you have a you know pretty modern i5 i7 box if you're doing a lot of analytics, and then you can offload that hardware um, you know, acceleration to a processor, and it'll go out there and, and grind away um, based off of QuickSync, and so that's a that's a good thing. Um, Milestone, which is more of a commercial product, they have a free solution for, uh, I think, eight or ten cameras is free. Uh, eight cameras, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. But that's a decent solution. It's probably more complicated than it needs to be. Um, but that's a free one. Uh, on the Mac, if you're a Mac person and you got Macs laying around, Security Spy is pretty good um, for the money. Now it scales with cost based off of your camera count. So it gets kind of expensive once you add more than you know, four or five cameras. But um, yeah, Security Spy is pretty good. And those are all kind of mainstream consumer um, things. But usually Blue Iris is going to be my go-to at, at home. So uh, that's, that's a good thing. Blue Iris, is that $60 per year or is that one-time fee? No, that's one-time. So it's a purchase software. And then you want it once, once you buy it, you want it. I think he's got another $60 a year built, built in for like support if you – choose to you know leverage their help desk or whatever which i think just an email to him is 60 bucks a year but uh they got really active forums and so you really don't need 
much support after the initial, uh, you know, purchase. So, uh, unlimited camera, unlimited camera calendar. It's up to sixty-four. So, so one more question is license plate recognition. Any recommendations? Uh, yeah, so license plate recognition gets. Um, it's pretty cool. It gets a little dicey um, because of the exposure. So they do have dedicated license plate cameras. So first of all, for like for good LPR, you really need a dedicated camera with dedicated exposure settings. You can't just throw a camera out looking out towards the road and your sidewalk and your grass and everything else. And during the day, during you know optimal times, you might get it, but at night it's going to stink because you're going to have IR blaring and. The, the exposure is going to be way blown out because the tag lights are all going to be white. And so you're not going to get any detail off the plate. So what you have to do is zoom in on that area and dial back your exposure so you can actually read the plate. And so there are some out there. We, we kind of played with that with some Christmas-like friends. Uh, there's a $200 Dehua we've been buying. I can get you the model number um, that's got like a, I think a 60 millimeter lens in it and you can get some pretty good range out of it. It's not a true blue LPR camera. Once you get in the enterprise, when we buy an LPR camera, it's 5,000, 6,000 bucks. And, um, you know, it's made for that. But you can get a $200 camera and adjust your exposure and get pretty good results out of it. Once again, you can go to IP Cam Talk and read more about, you know, people tweaking with it and looking at those things. But uh, that's that's for LPR. There's a um, software package out there. It's called Open L ALPR. And... For, I think it's free for you know, their kind of downloaded version that's open source, and then they've got cloud-based solutions and, and different monthly uh, packages that will actually analyze the tag and spit out OCR text based off of what it sees in that scene. And uh, that's a software solution that hooks up to your hardware solution. So, so did you want to go through your case study of the home, and then uh, we'll wrap it up with any final questions? I got, I got one question. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Uh, from a legal standpoint, uh, I, don't, I know it's state to state, but what about signs? Do you have to put signs up and stuff like that? My, and I'm not an attorney, but my uh, general general guidance is is that you know if you can see it from you know from public view, which is where the cameras are. So if you're looking down the street, if you're looking down, you know whatever that can be seen from public view, then you're okay. So obviously you can't go plant it somewhere where you don't own it or somewhere where you don't have any business being or somewhere that you can't see from public view. But if you're on your property and you've got a camera looking uh, and it's yeah, somewhere in public view, then you're okay. Now, once again, I got no interest in looking at that stuff because a good security guy uh, doesn't want to sit there and stare at my neighbor's yard and neighbor's house or whatever else. I mean, it's not a real courteous thing to do to begin with, but uh, as well as I don't care. I care about my choke points and my uh, my areas of interest that I don't want to waste uh, my you know, field of view on stuff that I've got no control over. And so from a personal standpoint, I keep pretty tight you know, reins on what I'm looking at because that's what I'm interested in. Um, but as far as like like a Christmas shooting down the road, you know, the law would say, hey, you can stand up you know, my top window and look out the road as well, and I can see everything there. So what's the difference with having a camera out there? You know, so I, if I can see it from plain view. So that's the non-attorney security guy answer. Even here in Southern crazy California, as long as your cameras are in plain view, you can record anything that is public and you can include, you can also record anything that is private, your own private property. As long as you don't have your cameras pointed in a direction that's intrusive to your neighbors within like private windows or whatever, if your cameras are pointed specifically on your property and or pointed at public areas, as long as they're in plain view, you don't need to put signs up. Now, you know, now if you point a camera at your neighbor's window, then you've got a problem. But if you're recording your own property, then that's fine. <laughs> Yeah. And signs can be a deterrent. I've actually worked with people before who had a really kind of a, a bad property line, and um, they went out there and bought the most giant security domes they could find and put them on poles, and there wasn't a dang thing in those things. They were just empty, giant globes. But, man, it looked like they had cameras like a prison lined up and up down the fence. And um, it was a great deterrent because everybody thought they had you know, huge cameras. So signage and cameras and all that can serve as a deterrent as well. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of a different thing. That's not really my strategy, uh, but that, that can work. So, Okay, Russell, so why don't you show uh, 
your case study and um, and then we can wrap it up after that with any other final questions. Yeah, did we have any other questions in chat? Somebody was asking about VLANs, I think. So anyway, we can we can talk about that later, I guess. <clears throat> Was this helpful for you? Was this helpful or too quick or what? It's very helpful. I have, I have one quick question, maybe some insight uh, while we're talking about the legal stuff. Um, I know that in my local area, um, the police department actually has a list you can sign up on that if you have a camera system, if there's any crime in the area, then you know you can show them your. Uh, your cameras or whatever, they'll call you and say, hey, there was a crime, yada, 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 do you have any footage? Recommendations for, against, anything? Hold on, I was pulling up other stuff. Um, so as far as people looking at your, other people looking at your cameras? Uh, like local PD, they, yeah. uh, they have a list that you can put yourself on if you have a camera system and if there's oh. any crime reported in the area then they'll give you a call or shoot you an email and say, hey, you know, there was this crime, would you mind if you look at your camera? Um, pros, cons, any comments yeah, on that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm, friendly with, I'm friendly with law enforcement based off of what I do. So, I, you know, I, I always like to partner with law enforcement typically. Um, I, you know, I know other people who would not want to be on any kind of registry and it's none of their business. Um, so I, mean, I think that's more of a personal view thing. But I typically find that working with law enforcement uh, for the most part, is, is to your benefit, and and having a relationship with those guys is to your benefit, and it's a partnership. So I think it takes a lot of community interest and, and, and skills. And at the end of the day, uh, working with law enforcement like that helps our communities be safer and stronger. If you can go and help them, because those guys respond to a call and they just say, "Hey, somebody kicked my back door in," and you know, there's no real fingerprints and no idea who it was. And what are they supposed to go off of? But if they do know that there's somebody three doors down that has a system and, you know, you can go out there and say, well, he was driving a red Mazda and he'd been here two nights before, you know, that becomes a lot more helpful. And so my personal view is, is working with law enforcement is a, a good thing and it makes us better as a community. But um, that's, like I said, that's probably different for different people. So. So, yeah, I've, I've worked with them on for my business with credit card theft and so on. Just be prepared to spend some time with them going through video. And I even had one time where they actually wanted me to give them my hard drive so that they had the original footage. Yeah, yeah that is a little spooky, but, uh, yeah. So, Russell, there is a question about uh, whether camera system uh, should be connected to a different network. Uh, DVR is connected to Netgear Wi-Fi extender, connected to the main router, and um, they seem to have a problem. So, Yeah, so I, I do prefer to keep them uh, on a separate network from a security standpoint, from a cybersecurity standpoint, because once again, you're getting these you know, $150 Chinese cameras. They're super cool but they're probably not patched very well. They do have vulnerabilities. And so I don't want to keep that on my IT network. And so I do prefer to segment them. I don't know if that's where he's going or if he's going with a performance thing. I don't like wireless extenders either, um, but that's a whole other, you know, sometimes you don't have much of a choice. But um, yeah, I do prefer to keep them on a separate network. I don't know if that answers the question or not, but. Yeah, there is another question about dummy cameras and the liability that extends to them because people have a false sense of security that one is occurring. I think the case that you're referencing and, and the other cases have to deal with commercial situations. And I know in shopping centers that, that you know, women have been attacked and they had ex an expectation of security because of the cameras and then only to learn that they weren't recording or weren't there. And then a, a lawsuits have have emanated from that. But as far as I, Russell, are you aware of anything as far as a homeowner having dummy cameras? No, and I've, anything I've coming from of, that? Yeah, and once again, I'm not an attorney, but I've never heard of that being, uh, you know, uh, uh, I can't imagine that being a liability standpoint just by the fact that you have something that looks like a camera, because now you have things that don't look like cameras. I mean, I don't know how having something that appeared to be a camera that was or wasn't working, you know, obligates you to some kind of, you know, responsibility of, of, you know, recording and all that, because 
all right, what if I had a camera that was recording garbage or the lens was all fogged up or, you know, there's spider webs all over it or, you know, it, it, the hard drive filled up. I mean, I, you know, I don't know if you can go out there and, and say, and once again, I don't know the law, but, you know, if somebody saw something that appears to be a camera, you're automatically obligated to have that recording perpetually forever and, and you know, never fail or, you know, you've got to back that up with some kind of video. I don't know about that. But, well, you know. I, I, I think I, I, the delineation is between a homeowner having a dummy camera there and a commercial situation. There, there is yeah. a very famous case of, of a woman who was attacked uh, in a, a parking garage with a, a camera system there. And, and she thought that they were recording and she was trying to motion for, you know, the people watching it. And everything, and she, I, I believe, was raped in it and attacked from this. And um, she won a multi million dollar lawsuit because there wasn't anything, it, it was just dummy cameras. And um, in, in the one right above where she was at, because she was trying to position herself with the criminal and everything, and it, it just didn't work out. So, but I think the, the situation is whether it's a commercial or a, yeah. a residential. And so, I think the focus of Russell's presentation really is for. A home use residential oh, type yeah, situation yeah. and probably yeah, is not applicable. The, yeah, yeah, for sure. If we start talking about all the nuances of uh, commercial and industrial setups, then it gets way complicated and way expensive. But um, I'll have to read up on that case. That's pretty interesting because still, even if they're recording, your obligation to watch all those cameras twenty four seven. I mean, you look at something like a major, you know, a major league baseball stadium or a casino or whatever, you know, where you've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cameras to think that all of those are being live viewed 24 7 with intense focus uh you know it was it's, it's yeah probably, i believe the case is in california but yeah so anyway, i don't know I'll have to look. that's interesting so so well, let, let's if you wouldn't mind doing your uh case yeah, study sure. that you yeah, absolutely so let me share my screen again so i did i put something out on uh the main x lights support forum that said, hey, you know, anybody that kind of, I didn't want to stack the deck and do some kind of fake case study or whatever. So I was like, you know, first person to respond, we'll do a, a security analysis. And so just to see what that's going to look like, let me share my screen. And so, oh, there we go. So Gary in California was generous and said, hey, I'll, uh, I'll participate. And so he sent me kind of pictures of his house sent me some concerns and hopefully he's on right Can you see i am on sir all right so anyway so what we did is said all right show me some pictures during the day at night and during the christmas season kind of show me your props and things like that and let's look at it so um once again and, and once again gary does a pretty good job because the first thing i did is pulled it up on, you know on the overview and he's got a you know big concrete wall all the way around so he's got a good you know, a good fence and so we can kind of go in here and see you know, what he's got and what he's got to work with. And um, so what are some of your concerns as far as, you know, problems you've had in the past and, and areas of uh, areas of concern for you? Well, I was telling you when uh, I was married, I wasn't living here, but my daughter was living here. And really late one night, she heard some noises outside. A guy ended up, was completely blasted, climbed over the wall on the right of the house there, thinking it was his house, yeah. went down that side back behind the shed. I was laying back behind the shed here. Over here? Uh, no, to the left, all the way back in the corner. Yeah, right here. Right here. Yeah. So he was back in there, that's that side. So yeah. you know, she called the cops, they came out and got him. Right. So, because that, that whole area back there is completely dark. Right, 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 right. So yeah, that, the first thing's first, and this, so that's why I wanted to see it at night is say, all right, come on, let's look at it from a criminal standpoint. So it does have an area light right here, but you can see that whole right side of the house is kind of inviting. Right. Um, and, and so you can see from like we're talking about. So he's got, this is what we like to see. So I like to see area lights right here at the entranceway. I like to see stuff at the driveway. That's all pretty good. Uh, I've got a little bit of concern over here for this gate. Now, do you keep that gate locked? Yeah, I keep it locked. The neighbors do have a motion light that comes on, like if I go empty the trash or something. Yeah. And they have, right now they have a bunch of dogs, but so we can't. And that's the thing is we can't count on the neighbors uh, right. because you got no control over that. And so we kind of, and we're just talking through this thing. So I'm not beating Gary up. <laughs> so the first thing we do is like, all right, maybe you know we want a light on this side of the house. Um, we probably yeah. 
we probably do want to light on this side of the house somewhere um, and, and you know, kind of give that area some interest. Now that could be a motion light. Uh, that could be, a, you know, I'd rather see something that's on all the time, but that might be kind of obtrusive. So at least have a motion light over there since that has been a problem in the past. And if we look, you know, like I said, it's, it's dark. So uh, I'd like yeah. to keep that gate you know, kind of uh, illuminated. I'd like to keep this area of the house illuminated. And so that's one place to start. If we look here at night, same kind of deal back in this corner. Um, and that might all be able to be covered by one light. But, you know, over here in this corner, it's dark, man. And yeah. so the fact you've got this on is good. That kind of warts away evil. But, um, you know, still something back on this gate. And it may all be captured from the front if, you know, if you got a side light here or something back on this corner because it's dark, dark. And once again, the fences are good. And that's what I thought when I said, like, man, this guy, he's got it he's got it together because he's got a fence all the way around and a gate and everything else. And normally you don't even see that. But um, I would recommend lighting uh, back here, at least on this corner, so you can keep your problem areas at bay and illuminated. And what that does, first of all, it's an active deterrent. You know, it, it makes it a lot less attractive. Second of all, once you put cameras up, and we'll focus that on that in a second, but once you put cameras up, then uh, you get a lot better image. So if you put a camera up, and they're pretty good with IR and all that, you can see in pitch black dark, but if you have just a little bit of area lighting out there, the image quality gets a lot better, especially with the lower end cameras. Um, if you go out there and put in some lighting, you're gonna get a lot better results with a comes you know? And so I think a little bit of lighting would help a lot. And I uh, like your fence, I would keep that gate, and I think we talked about it, so uh, yeah, but I would keep that gate locked. Light. And so that way you're not having a bunch of people coming in and out and um, it's it always locked. Good. Awesome. Using it. Good. And so you know, it looks like you got blinds and everything up front. You don't keep yeah. a whole lot of stuff in the open plain view. So once again, it looks pretty good. I was hoping for somebody with like terrible security, but you're pretty good. <laughs> it's dark, uh, but you know, the fact that you've got the you know the, the fencing, the fact that you do have some lighting is all good. Yeah, so, street light wise down just in past the neighbor's driveway on the left there there's a street light there and then there's not another one till the other side of the street down like another house so it's not those don't put out a whole lot of light right cool so when it comes to christmas um this was your display and i know you've got plans for you know more right that was my first year so i didn't have a whole lot uh, and so the fact that it's close up to the house helps some does not you know right up against the street it doesn't help a whole lot but it does help some and i try to keep my stuff you know, off the street as well um but that's not a yeah it's not like a a, a big deal um but to uh, you know we could talk about putting in a temporary if you fix the area lighting it's probably enough to cover um but you can talk about putting in a, a temporary light or something um you know for the christmas season and when we talk about your camera layout we're going to have that here in a second and i think we've got you covered there so Anyway, overall pretty good. Uh, like I said, I put the light back in the backyard by the shed. I'd hit your corners in the gate, hit that problem wall uh, with some lighting. And maybe, like I said, maybe a motion light here. Don't count on the neighbors. And yeah. I think we're good there. Uh, I was hoping to fuss about fencing and locks and gates and all that, but you've done a good job. So uh, no problems. <clears throat> so when it comes to uh, camera layout, and this is back when we're talking about, you know, field of views and all that, I can go out there and do um, – a, a sample layout based off of you know camera locations so i was talking to gary earlier he does have a doorbell camera already uh, i would normally recommend you have one on your front porch right there at the entrance way that keeps you know for things like package theft um people coming in just general identification i always like to have one on your front porch front doorway and so also i want to overview of the front yard so this is important to me this is kind of a choke point so he's got a a fence all the way around, and that's not to say it's not you know penetrable because he's already had a problem back here. But um, you know, I see this as kind of a choke point where most people are probably going to come through here. They're not going to likely come through the neighbor's yard, yard, jump their fence, and then come jump your fence. It could happen. It's but, happened. Yeah. So, and that's why we've got this stuff back here. So we got lighting, and we, we're going to pop them with a the camera. Uh, but and, and two. So if we go back to where you are today. Yeah, you know, that's that's pretty inviting. But once we shoot a camera down this way and put lighting up here, that becomes a lot less attractive. And plus, you're going to get them if they come over here and you know they pop that light. You're going to get them. 
and that you know if it's plus if you do motion uh that's going to be a deterrent too because they jump that fence it hits motion and um comes on and it's gonna you know startle so but this is too attractive for them now on that camera you're showing uh like pointing this towards what we're looking at right now here you seeing like put that um on the corner of the house because i yeah. obviously i could put it on the wall because the problem is that right. corner of the house is about even with you know the side of the shed on this side so it wouldn't capture any of the shed sure and i was wondering should it be on the other side of that roof you know line there well, like kind of on the edge of the path no down like where that other blue one is except pointing yeah, towards yeah. the shed yeah and so when i was looking at it um and when we were talking i didn't really ca i thought <laughs> i thought this would so if you look i thought oh, this was yeah. the shed and so uh patio cover <laughs> yeah 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 so see how i labeled the camera i said shed because that was yeah. a point of interest so but that's okay so what we can do is we'll go out there and we can even hit anybody right. really out better it's, it's hard to do without seeing the physical way out yeah know? but um what we're going to do here is, if you look, let me pull up the details of this thing. This work is pretty cool. And you can actually, and I'm, I'm a member here, but you can get a, you can access this for free. I don't think you can save things. But what this will do is, see, I'm going to go in there and change my field of view. So I go in there, set my camera type. And so you can see this is a Dehua uh, 5231RZ, which is a popular Chinese camera I like. It's very focal. And so I can go in there, and this will be at like 13 millimeters. And this will be at like 2.8 millimeters. And so what you can see is I've got that narrowed in because once again, that's a good field of view. Uh, I want to focus in on that area. And you can go in here and look at the detail. And so as I get wider, if I capture more and more and more, if you look right here and watch this detail degrade, because I've gone in there and captured a lot more at a wider angle and that detail degrades. So that's a simulated kind of um, you know, the depiction of what it would look like based off of your you know, settings. So if I'm zoomed in here and gathering cool. a lot more of that detail, you can see it degrade. Um, so we're gonna go in there and, and capture that area. Um, you know, we could come back here since we're flying. Below. I figured maybe like, because I have that light that's under the patio cover there, I figured maybe like that out, kind of pointing towards that corner, yep. like back in that way area. So we, we can go there and, and tweak it. Um, I went in there and said, all right, well, I don't like that gate. And once again, we might put one here since that's where your bad activity is. Uh, we can go down there and fire down that alleyway, um, you know, on the other side of the house if you wanted to as well. But, I, you know, that gate kind of spooked me. And so I went out there and said, well, let's go in there and point at that gate. Once again, a very narrow uh, frame of view. And so I'm getting that gate and get people walking directly in that gate. Then I said, well, I want to see the driveway. So on the corner of the house, and you see where that field view starts. I'm, you know, this is simulating the corner of your house. But I want to go out there and capture the corner of your house. So you can see if they're standing at the road, you look down here at the detail. And this is 37 feet away to the sidewalk. And this is uh, pixels per foot. So that's kind of a simulated detail. And you can see what, you know, roughly what it would look like um, based off the camera resolution and that, um, you know, the, 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 resolution we have it set at and the field of view we have it set at, as well as just get an overview of the overall yard so this is kind of my you know situational cam uh traffic uh folks coming up through the yard whatever and so if somebody comes through we're going to get that uh field of view and we're going to get that uh, that person coming through and you can see so since this is wider you see how the detail is not nearly as fine at the road because this is a very wide angle shot. So you're going to see them coming in, but you're not going to make positive identification until you know they start coming closer uh, based off of the wide angle of that. But I'm capturing, you know, probably what 50, 60 feet worth of area there. Um, and so you're losing quality based off of um, that wide angle lens. So as you come in, you can see what it would look like simulated. Now, since the other one's covering the driveway, would you just maybe take that you know bottom one have it kind of hit at the top of the corner of the driveway there instead or this one or this uh one? that camera but that the dot that's at the bottom of that triangle there yep. on that one so we moved the bottom dot up like to the edge of the driveway no the other one the one on the bottom oh i got you so you look yeah. back at the road kind of where you know it's covered and you know we're so it's not really cross covering so much yeah Maybe um, a bit or something. so you're saying angle it more up like angling up to the left or yeah. counterclockwise. Yeah. 
Um, definitely could. Let me grab it. I don't want to spin it. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Just had to click on it right. Yeah, we could. Uh, you know, and once again, I didn't want to start, like we talked about earlier, you know, branching off into the neighbor's yard too much. Yeah. But uh, that, I think that's acceptable. So, yeah, you could do it like that. So what I was doing when I had it down there is trying to cover you know this spot too. But once again, we got them at this choke point here. So if they come through here, we're not really worried about so close to the house. So and I have my video stored off. So that helps too. It's, yeah, that does help. Funny because it's great at night. It's really good. I can see all the way across the street during the day. It like because it's so bright and it's in that entryway. It really washes out as soon as it hits that arch opening, and you can't tell anything outside there. Yeah, so sometimes it depends on the model, but sometimes you could tweak that. You know, you could go into your exposure settings and dial it back some based off the of time periods. Yeah. And so if it's, you know, super bright, you can go back there and dial it back some. I have to look. So anyway, but in short, I think with four or five cameras, you could get a, a lot of detail. So um, and, and, and a lot of coverage. And then once again, this stuff's addictive, like lights and everything else. So you start liking that. You're like, man, I'm going to put one here and, you know, shoot down this way. Or I'm going to go out there and I do this. I move cameras. So I pulled one off at Christmas. Actually, I was like, man, this temporary camera I'm using is pretty dang good. And so I actually went and replaced one of my permanent uh, installed cameras with that temporary camera and then relocated the permanent camera to another area uh, that I didn't have any views on and kind of cycled through them. So with these very focal cameras, that's where that comes into play because I'm able to go in there and, and kind of zoom in, zoom out, and um, it's set. You know, this is really, so zoom, zoom out's not as important as this, so I can go out there and capture, um, you know, like I said, my, my field of view and change uh, change the focal width of the camera. So anyway, so I think with two, three lights and four or five cameras, uh, you could change your exposure a lot. What about, um, you know, alarms and all that? You got alarms? I have an alarm system on the house. Good. Yeah. And, and I think that's important, too, uh, because that's kind of your third line of defense. Uh, you know, somebody gets through that. And to be frank, I used to support an alarm center and do a lot of their technology. And the number one customer service call we got was signs. And people would steal their yard signs because, in a sense, that's one of the most valuable parts of the system is people would see that sign out front saying protected by such and such. And uh, they'd steal it and go stick it in their yard. And so with signs and with the alarms that go off, you know, even if you don't have it monitored, it's not a big, you know, it's not a huge deal, I don't think, because once again, you're getting, you know, the, the, the attractiveness, it kind of falls away once you open that door and it starts making a bunch of racket and alarms go off. And, you know, the police department's so overworked anyway, and with alarm calls, it's not going to be like they're going to send the whole squad out, lights and sirens to your house. It's whoever's the on duty guy. Whenever he's not busy, he'll go do a perimeter check. But they're not going to go kick down the doors and look for the bad guys based off of a, you know a false alarm because or based off an alarm because they get them all day long. Yeah, I had a few years ago uh, on vacation up in Big Bear, and we had our Santa Anas going. You guys in SoCal know that around here, and uh, I got a call. Oh God, real early in the morning, and the apparently the door hadn't been latched tight enough, and it, the wind blew the door open which set the alarm off, of course. <laughs> and, and that's where video analytics or video having video comes into play because once you get that call, you can go back and I would right there on my phone and say, all right, hold on, you know, real quick because the alarm company is going to call you first. Right. And then you can go in there and look. And with this kind of coverage, you're going to be able to see, all right, sir, we got a call from your front door sensor or whatever, and you're going to be able to review that. And in between, you know, your front doorbell camera and these, you're going to pretty much know um, if it's a credible thing or not. And I can tell you, if you go in there and say, yes, it is, I see some guy, he just kicked in my door, uh, then they are going to send everybody lights and sirens and kick down the doors. Um, but, you know, you can quickly assess that situation, and that's going to work in your favor uh, if you're able to tell the alarm company, yes, it is a false alarm, or yes, I do see some uh, activity there. Uh, it's going to make a big difference in the response both ways because they're not going to go and nail you for false alarms. A lot of precincts do that now. They go and charge you for, you know, if you have your third false alarm in a corner right. or whatever, they'll start charging you. Um, so you can go in there and, and make very valid decisions based off of those layers of security you have. Okay. Well, thank you, Russell, very much. Um, are there any final questions for him before we uh, conclude the presentation? 
Doug had a question about uh, Blue Irish and the app. Yep. Uh, I, I didn't know if he was on mic. He asked in chat, um, if the, you know, the MBR, different apps and stuff like that seem to be a mess, which I have to agree with them there. Um, how well does the Blue Irish mobile app work? I like it. I like it a lot, especially on iOS. Um, I have not, uh, I've heard mixed reviews on Android. I think, you know, I think he kind of subs it out to somebody else to do the Android app. But uh, Blue Iris on iOS works really well. Uh, that's a great mobile app. So uh, I have not experienced Android firsthand, but I, I have friends that have, and they seem to like it. Okay, cool. Yeah, I have a, I've had a Lorex system for a few years now, and it's the, the cameras are fine. They're NDR, you know, IP cameras, but they're, uh, the recorder is worthless. Any time it senses motion, it drops all the frames. So it's essentially a, a garbage system. And uh, I've been with, once I get a new computer for X flights and other work, I'm going to relegate my old computer to uh, Blue Iris. So that's kind of the plans down the road. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good plan. Okay, well, thank you, Russell. I want to thank you for the presentation tonight and taking the time to put this together. For uh, sure, and thanks to Gary for uh, volunteering out at the house. Like I said, you got a, a good layout. And, um, and to go through the exercise, guys, the whole point of that was just to say, let's look at the house day, night, uh, let's look at lots, gates, lighting, uh, alarms, cameras, and just do a self-assessment. You don't have to be some security guy or, or you have some special software. Go out there and say, you know, where are my pain points? Where does my, uh, you know, my vulnerabilities lie? And address those things, man. Don't wait till you have a situation to address it. Address it now. Yeah, thanks for doing that, Russell, too. Yeah, Appreciate no it. It gives me a lot to think about. Yeah, no problem. Let us know how it goes. I will. The x Lights Project exists because of people like you. Help continue the project by making a donation today at xlights.org slash donate.